So our special guest today is John McNee. Welcome to the show. Oh, it's my pleasure. I rarely, if ever, turn down an opportunity to talk about myself. So thank you. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about yourself then and how you got started writing horror. Yeah, absolutely. So I am a selling, as opposed to best selling, a selling award wanting and critically reviewed horror author whose works include Prince of Nightmares, Grudge Punk, John McNeese, Doom Cabaret, and the new Hail Santa, which is coming out in time for Christmas. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know if there's, uh, there was ever a light bulb moment where I decided to get started in horror. I was sort of always writing uh, from, from as soon as I was taught how to write, I was, I was writing and maybe even before that. Um, and I always wanted to be a writer. That was my dream when I was a kid. And I think I always saw myself as writing, you know, sort of any kind of story I, I wanted to, or maybe crime and thriller and fantasy and sci-fi and stuff like this. So I did all sorts, but uh, no matter what I did, they were always quite, they ended up being quite violent, quite bloody, even when I was a kid. Um, you know, I remember doing competitions to, you know, to draw posters for like road safety or something. And everyone else would have, you know, a lollipop lady or something. And mine would just have a kid splattered across the road. You know, it's like, this is what will happen to you, this kind of stuff. So, you know, I used a lot of red crayons. Um, and so, you know, growing up, uh, I was always sort of writing sort of horror without really thinking about it or realizing it. And then in, uh, in university I had, I was in uni with a lot of time on my hands because I was a student with no money and no internet, which the kids these days don't understand. They don't really, they can't appreciate that. But that, you know, that was sort of serious boredom. And I thought to fill the time I would start writing. I mean, I'd been watching a lot of horror films as well. And I thought I would start writing some short horror stories and I would try writing the kind of horror that I enjoyed watching on screen. And I didn't know if that could even be done. I didn't know if that could translate to the page. Yeah. Um, and so I went out scouring bookshops and charity shops, trying to find works by other horror writers, most of whom I hadn't heard of. People like Kathy Koja, Richard Lehman, Sean Hudson, uh, James Herbert and stuff like that. And read, read a lot, an awful lot and sort of um, saw a way that you could actually um, put this kind of stuff down in prose. Yeah. Uh, and and then started then started writing and it was you know a few years before I actually submitted anything anywhere and now you know I've got stories published in various anthologies and uh, and have a few books. Fantastic! It's a good way to start, isn't it, by publishing them um, in the anthologies? De it's well, you know, it certainly was. I think it's a good way to get started um, writing in general is to write um, short fiction. Um, I think a lot of people f fail, but they, well, maybe not fail, but they definitely get stuck when they sort of decide I'm going to write a novel and they've never written anything before. Yeah. And it's, it's a, it's a big ask. So yeah, sort of, if you, you, you really learn your craft by writing little short pieces and learning how to end stories, I think. Yeah. So how do you, where do you get your ideas from and how do you process that? Mm, well, yeah, um, it's, it's it's sort of all over the place, I guess. Um, rarely from watching or reading horror. I don't think I, I, I get ideas that way. It's more sort of news, Wikipedia, YouTube conversations. It's uh, something will will strike you as an interesting premise for a story. I think if 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 something sounds like a good story. To me, uh, sort of from a dramatic standpoint, my challenge is always trying to introduce the horror element into it, give it a little bit of a, a twist there. Um, I watch a lot of Coronation Street, and I think there's sort of stories where there that I think, well, that would be interesting if there was, you know, an axe murderer involved or, or sort of a ghost or a possession or something like that. Um, and and so that's what I, I try to do. As for the horror element itself, I don't really know where they come from. Sometimes, you know, art or music videos. I mean, I can, I can place certain ones to various different different things. Um, 
just sort of bombarding myself with uh, with images. And there's always that moment where uh, of an evening as you're lying in bed when you're just on the cusp between wakefulness and sleep when your brain starts doing its own thing without yeah. you being in any control of it. And uh, the challenge there is to just, if if you happen to, to catch something, just hold on to it, you know, and try. <laughs> you can't always remember it when you wake up in the morning, but uh, but there's there's good stuff um, in there, just in the just in the dark workings of the subconscious mind itself. The the trick is to try and be open and 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 to receive these these little yeah. signals and images. So, where did you get the idea for Hail Santa? Well, yeah, that was. Um, that was sort of a more academic process, really. I was, um, what I wanted to do, what I want, I wanted to write, a, it wasn't about writing a, a Christmas horror novel. I wanted to write uh, a Slender Man story because um, I love Slender Man. I think he's, he's one of the greatest modern monsters that's ever been created. And I'm vaguely aware of the lore. I know there have been a lot of um books and stories written about Slender Man. And I wanted to a sort of a similar kind of of antagonist, a sim- similar kind of story. I'd, I'd watched the the trailer for this the actual Slend the official Slender Man movie and I know it was people were disappointed by it. And I was and I'd read read about the plot and how it goes. And I think and I was trying to come up with an idea, well how could you write uh, a Slender Man story and make it good? Because in the lore, Slender Man lives out in the woods and he sort of he has sort of enchanted all of these children who run around and and do his bidding despite him being obviously evil because he's promised things to them a big mansion where they can all go and live and in service to him they do all these terrible terrible things and i, I was just struck i don't know when it, it happened or why but i was th- pondering about this about the kind of knockoff slender man that i could create yeah. And I realized, well, who would children follow? Who would they do anything for? Uh, it's Santa Claus. If it's going to be anyone, you know, because Santa Claus, we tell children that, that monsters aren't real um, and supernatural things aren't real and all this sort of stuff. But Santa Claus, oh, he's real. You better believe it. And we provide evidence that he's real. So we we convince children of the existence of Santa Claus and of his, of his power, his incredible godlike abilities. <laughs> So if he shows up and tells them to do something, they're going to do it. And that's where this idea spun off from. So Hail Santa finds um, a, a small town which has an evil entity living just beyond its borders um, that feeds off on, on its people and has been doing for a very long time. And the children worship him because they believe it's it's Santa. Brilliant. So have you, have any of your characters been inspired by your own experiences or your own fears? Um, I'm not too sure. I mean, I guess everything is. Um, it's difficult to say, to point to anything in in particular when I'm coming up with characters. It's not a sort of annoyingly, oh, I, I see someone, I'm going to base a, uh, a story on them. When it comes to dialogue, I'll try to think of an actor who would fit the role and then try and think what they would say in a, in a scene. But that's really only for their introduction. Over the course of writing a thing, characters kind of take on their own shape and dimensions. And in my head, they'll stop resembling whoever I've I've uh, imagined them being anyway. Um, as for my own fears, uh, yeah. I mean, my my fears. Uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of stuff that I write is informed by my own fears, in that, uh, or, or fears or, or fascinations, that uh, the idea that reality is not what we perceive it to be, like there's something going on beneath the surface, or just or just behind the veil, like yeah. there's there's, and we we really don't put a lot of thought into it these mad little lives that we lead where we're all working and trying to pay for mortgages and trying to heat our homes and having arguments with our um, partners and our uh, our siblings and our friends and, and things and not really putting a lot of thought into the absurd 
horrifying nature of our existence. Yeah. And um, I like stories that where something just shows up that challenges everything that we believe we understand and, and everything that makes us comfortable um, and throws everything into doubt. And it is a fear, but it's also kind of a, a fantasy as well, because in many ways, wouldn't it be nice if something came along and said that everything that you've taken for granted, that's not all there is. There's a, there's a whole um, extraordinary universe out there of dark and evil, terrible things um, that, that you can have no conception of. So that kind of informs it. Um, my own you know, personal fears, fears of like a, you know, destitution and death and illness and and having to make small talk at parties. You know, these all these are things that sort of work in um, organically into the text. But I, I tend not to to focus on them too much. Yeah. So, what's your approach to getting the scares in the the actual book itself? Are you a plotter or are you a pantser? One hundred percent a plotter. Um, uh, going back to what I was saying earlier about um, about you know writing short fiction, one of the important things I think in your craft is to write start off writing short fiction because you figure out how to to end stories. That's a, a problem that a lot of people have. My en- endings are very very important to me. If I spend as a reader, if I go through a whole book it's like three hundred pages and I get to the end and you know it might start very well, but if the, if the ending's rubbish, that's what I'm going to remember. Yeah. It's going to annoy me. So I try to make, so I try to build towards, I never start a book unless I have the ending or any story, unless I have the ending clear in my mind about where I'm going to go. And there are, and I, and I plot things out as far as I can. Things change in the pro in the process of writing. Um, they always do. There's things you haven't thought out or things that you do have thought out, but when you actually write them down, they don't work. And then you, so you have to go on various details. But uh, but no endings are always um, absolutely crucial. So yeah. I always work towards um, work towards a specific goal and do a lot of plotting. Right. And I think uh, yeah, I think a lot of people as well. Um, and I would advise most people to to plot. As a reader myself, I can usually I feel like I can tell when a writer is uh, just making things up as they're going along. They think I can't tell, but I can. <laughs> and it annoys me because I think as a reader, it's you, you, you want someone to, to know where they're, to know where they're going to actually be, be crafting. Uh, so you want to, to have thought that someone's put a lot of you know work into taking you somewhere exciting and satisfying. Um, and I think a lot of people, when they are pantsing to use that terminology, they, they get lost in the reason it takes them a while for them to find where they're going and that can be a slog for for them and for a reader so yeah i prefer a nice tight well organized plot fantastic so what's been the hardest part about writing for horror the boring parts those are the those are the really really, i mean you should avoid boring scenes obviously but uh when you're writing a horror story you've got to have uh big Big highs, but you've got to have lulls as well in the in the action to make the the big scares and all of the people getting limbs torn off to make that work dramatically. You've got to have some quiet parts, and that's the challenge. I think I I enjoy. I'm energized by writing, you know, action, but it's nothing without the 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 lulls. So trying to write them and make them interesting. Um, while also while serving their purpose of you know being a dramatic pause uh, is a challenge and the character moments you know the the quiet times when you fi- have just two characters in a room where they're supposed to make some kind of connection or or you're supposed to learn something about them that deepens the reader's emotional attachment to them but without being trite or obvious or just have placeholder hall- hallmark dialogue um though those are tough um, and those are the ones that really keep me just agonized at the at the laptop for a few nights, you know, trying to trying to figure out what to what to put in that I know is going to 
uh, still engage the reader and get them to the next part, which is where all the blood is. Um, but yeah, that's, there's no way, real way around that. You've just got to, um, you've just got to put the work in. Yeah, I find that difficult as well. I'm all right with the horror bits, yeah, bits, but the other bits where the characters are connecting and you're getting up to that part, mm -hmm. it can be quite stressful. Yeah, yeah, to get it all together. Absolutely, yeah, it can be tedious to do, and the trick is the the trick is trying to not make it tedious for the reader, but you know, it's 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 work. <laughs> so, what's been the most challenging scene that you've done? Mm, um, it, I mean, it's, it would be a boring answer, but it, the, the most challenging part of Hail Santa was just, I think there are a couple of scenes. There's one in particular I'm thinking of where there's multiple characters, maybe 10 characters trapped in a room and they're all talking and trying to write that scene while keeping the conversation moving and going between different characters and knowing where all the different characters are and have it not be, and have it, you know, flow well and be comprehensible to, um, to a reader and engaging and, you know, interesting without sort of losing, without being completely overwhelming with all these different characters. And it's almost a sort of a town hall scene even, but, uh, and which works fantastically well in a film, you know, but, on the page, it's tough because you've got so many characters and you're trying to give them all uh, their own voice and make it clear where everyone is and where they're all at. So that that took a bit of a while, but it's not it's not a very exciting answer, I don't think. But that's the the sort of the actual craft where the of the, of the thing comes into play. That's where the the challenge is. Whereas, like I said, you know, writing big emotional moments or 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 you know terrifying. Uh, you know, the exchanges with with monsters or action pieces. That's the stuff that I really enjoy. So I don't find it as much of a, a challenge as as just a bunch of people talking in a room. Yeah. So how have people um, taken to Hail Santa? Uh, so far, really well. It's been out on Kindle for um, about a week. Uh, the paperback is coming out in a few days time and a few advanced reader copies have gone out to um, some various other, uh, some various uh, folk in, I think uh, mostly Canada, cause that's where it's set and, uh, and a few in America, but uh, of the people who've uh, read it, the, the reviews have been great four and five stars so far. Um, people really enjoying it. A lot of people um, have received it and say they're saving it for Christmas um, and which is fine. I would love it if they would <laughs> maybe not save it to Christmas and read it now and review it so that, you know, everyone hears more about it. But, uh, but yeah, no, it's, uh, it's uh, nice that people are incorporating it into part of their holiday. Hopefully it might become a bit of a, of a holiday tradition for some people. And I see, um, folk, uh, constantly on, on social media, on the book groups, uh, asking for recommendations for Christmas horror. I'm, hoping maybe this time next year a lot of people will be recommending hail santa yeah it's always a good it's always a good feeling when they do that isn't it when you get sort of like people recommending your book yeah yeah it is fantastic there's only so far that i can get by by recommending it myself to other yeah. people people tend to see through that you know and i i don't have sock, sock puppet accounts these days so it's you know, i need other people to do the work for me <laughs> yeah marketing's full-time on its own isn't it once you've read oh, yeah. the book <laughs> uh -huh. yeah, that's that's talk about challenges that's a challenge yeah so what's your most memorable feedback that you've had um well my first book uh prince of nightmares got has had a lot of reviews and a lot of feedback and people have said that it's uh some people have said well some people that it's given the nightmares which is always a pleasure to to hear and some people have called it the most um the goriest thing <laughs> they've ever read the most violent thing they've ever read which i i was was pleased about reading that because i remember at the time writing it thinking this is not this is not enough gore. How can I put more blood and gore and violence into this? I need to, and it was a real, it was a real anxiety for me that it wasn't violent enough, that it wasn't going to make an impact. And I've had 
many, many one star reviews from people saying, this is just gore for the sake of gore. It's ridiculous. And I'm, and me thinking, well, okay, good. At least that's, <laughs> it's, it, it, I actually achieved what I wanted to achieve. Um, but yeah, feedback for um, Prince of Nightmares was generally uh, great. Um, but you know, it, was, it, ranged, it ranged from five stars to one star. Um, but I tend to agree yeah. with basically everything. Um, that, that people say, some people say, this is the best book ever written. John McNeese, the greatest writer's ever lived. I think, yeah, I agree with that. And then someone else will come along and say, this book was terrible. The writer didn't know what he was doing. And I think, yeah, that's, uh, I was just hoping you wouldn't notice. So, yeah. So <laughs> I try not to take uh, any you know feedback that anyone gives me too seriously because um, I know I think all sorts of things about myself and my opinion changes um, from day to day about everything that I've I've written. Yeah, I think that's the problem, isn't it? We yeah. as, as authors, we are the worst critics of ourselves. Well, yeah, yeah. I'm a terrible critic of myself and also um, my biggest fan. Uh, at the same time, <laughs> so yeah, it's it's difficult to know from from day to day. Um, when I wake up in the morning, am I going to be you know uh, loving my work today, or am I going to be uh, hating it? But uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, as I, I, I as long as other people do, in, some other people do enjoy it. That's that's great. Fantastic. So, what advice would you have for aspiring writers who want to break into the horror genre? Mm, uh, well, going back to a bit of what I said earlier, absolutely start with short stories um, before diving into novellas or um, or novels. Um, I as for placing these days, I'm not so sure. The publishing industry, of the indie, independent publishing industry, the small press industry has changed um, so much since I was starting out about 10 years ago, I don't see as many submission calls for anthologies or magazines that there used to be. If I was trying to place a story somewhere these days, I would be maybe looking for, aiming for um, podcasts, you know, getting audio adaptations or, you know, YouTubers to read um, stories out. That might be one, the route that I would pursue. As for writing horror, certainly you should be reading a lot of horror. Um, and there's an awful lot out there, you know, which, which is good. When I was first searching um, for for horror fiction, to just to so that I could see, to see if anyone was actually doing the kind of stuff that I had in mind, you know, I had to go to um, you know local bookshops and charity shops, which then and today have nothing. Basically, there's you know, you'll be very very lucky to find any decent horror books in any in any you know, bricks and mortar bookshops whereas today you've got amazon you've got godless you've got you know free stuff um online all over the place so you can certainly um certain the the the, the material is there to be read so uh so definitely um you know check it out and read as widely as possible and not just horror either but read you know plenty of other um different genres because as, as i say that's where you uh you find the best um, the best stories that then you can twist in your own uh, terrifying way. Yeah, I think when you read different genres, it also shows you the different writing styles as well, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. And that's important if you're going to, because when you're, I think when you're starting out, the trickiest thing to find uh, is your own voice. And um, yeah, seeing how other people do it and how they, they write. And when you start, when you read enough of one author, I find you start writing like them, um, which is which has its pluses and its its minuses. So you know, there's a lot of people who uh, horror writers who will only read really one writer, one run writer, and then everything they read sounds kind of sounds like um, you know a pale imitation of that author. Whereas if you pull different um, if you read widely and have as many different sources as possible and as many different authors going through your your head, that will in, in, infect your your own writing. And eventually through that, I think you'll find your own writing style. Yeah. So do you find, do you have any remorse for what you put your readers through? No, not at all. <laughs> um, no, uh, I, I think, hmm, I was at once at, a conv uh, at an event where I sold a book 
to um, a girl, and I don't know how old she was. She might have been 12 or maybe younger, and I felt a bit bad about that um, because <laughs> I, was like, I wasn't sure it was really so I mean, her mum came up and bought it for her. She was like, the girl was like, I want, to, want that one in her mum. And I thought, well, okay. I mean, <laughs> she's, got, she's being supervised. Um, but, you know, I was, at the same time, I was reading um, stuff way out of my, um, age range when I was um, a kid, so that's that's the one you know time that I can I have a little bit of uh, sort of guilt or queasiness over that. But for the rest, no, not at all. I'm glad. And I, I, the thing about my books, there's some um, uh, some dark stuff in in Prince of Nightmares and some uh, some stuff about sort of loss and grief and all that stuff, but not too much. I think. Uh, people who are put through the ringer emotionally by by the books they read and it's by a lot of modern horror which tends to be really depressing stuff like tearing your heart to pieces and uh, and really depressive I, I'm 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 not so focused on that I want my most of my stuff to be fun um really it's 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 frightening it's bloody um but um I think I think, I want the the readers to have um, a good time, and I think if you're a horror fan, for the most part, you will. Yeah, absolutely. So, where can we find your books? Uh, well, they're all currently available on um, Amazon, and uh, a couple of them are on Godless as well. And you can, and and Americans can find on most sort of uh, independent retailers, Barnes and Noble, and that kind of stuff like that. Um, I'm going to be making uh, a couple of, I'm going to be making signed paperback copies of, or the plan is to make signed paperback copies of Hail Santa and uh, Doom Cabaret, my short um, story collection, available on my website, which is johnmcnee.com in the near future. And if anyone wants to go to my website, they can also get a free download of my other short story collection, John McNee's Splatter Party. So that, again, that's johnmcnee.com. <laughs> and what's Splatter Party like? Uh, Splatter Party is a, is a collection. Um, it's just five short stories of pretty um, pretty short and, uh, and, and violent little tales. Um, finding people in, of people, you know, getting into just in, in just being in the in the wrong place at the wrong time, really, and uh, and and you know, encountering um, sort of strange uh, entities or you know, fall, or, or 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 weird um, underground cabals of, of people it's uh yeah there's there's a few different pieces in there there's one piece which um i was originally going to put in john mcnee's doom cabaret and the the publisher at that time said it was a little too far on the the extreme side so you know so i left it out and i put it in splatter party so really it is kind of the the best and worst of my <laughs> short horror stories <laughs> well it's been lovely having you on the show john so thank you very much for accepting my invite yeah it's been great i've enjoyed it <laughs>